Just but. in case anyone's wondering, those would you rather that we couldn't do, we did them. Yeah. During the yeah. break. Here's a good kind of easy one. Would you rather punch easy. your mom or your grandma? Just got a little rear bag and just sock him. Oh. My mom might be okay sometimes yeah, if I go ahead and punch my grandmother. I don't even think I can make that choice. Of I all the either. choices I have made, I like don't know that I can nope. even answer that question. Brody, so you have to. Brody Miller from The Athletic joining us as he does every Wednesday. Uh, me and him will be recording the Hold That Podcast podcast of the show today. Brody. Nobody cares about that. They just want to know if you'd do a 16-year-old troll or wait till a 32-year-old <laughs> supermodel. Okay, it was a <laughs> hobbit. It was a hobbit. And he and he did answer uh he he did answer hobbit. Would you rather I mean, would you rather punch your mom or your grandmother though, Brody? Um my grandmother's like a really tough woman. I'm gonna go grandmother. Like, <laughs> wow. Hey, there you go. Yeah. You know, a man, no hesitation. Yeah. From the, uh... She grew up on a farm in Kentucky. <laughs> also, Brody's kind of like a, a a weak little man too, so that makes that makes a lot of sense as well. Uh, I don't think a punch would do much you damage. Me. You got me so good. Mm-hmm. Okay, Brody. Um, Y'all are cute. Uh, yeah, we have a, we have a little we have a little barb thing. We do a little flirting, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. a little yeah, yeah. little hair pulling on the playground, <laughs> yeah, if you will. The will they uh, He he gets me quite a bit actually. You're it. No, he, you're it. Yeah, he he tags me pretty <laughs> no, good. You're uh, the best. You're awesome. He's very witty. So that's why yeah. it's fun to fun to mess with him. Um, he's also an okay writer. Check out his worthy at the athletic. And Brody, you've had a lot to write about recently in all of these LSU news. Out of everything that's happened, all the departures, everything else, do you have one guy or one departure that you think is kind of the most impactful for LSU? From the staff point of view? Um let's say staff or player. No, no, yeah, staff point of view. Because player, I mean, you got Joe Burrow. Like, yeah, let's say staff point of view. I think as much as, like, Brady got the acclaim, I just don't think you can really avoid how Dave Aranda, I mean, has been the rock at LSU for the past, you know, you know, four years and has been you know, the highest-paid defense coordinator of football and deservedly so. And, I mean, I, I just think – I think he's one of those things where he started to get a little criticized last year, but I think people will really realize how great he was once he's gone. But then you can also counter that by saying, all right, it looks like they have a very high-profile replacement of Bo Pelini who can probably keep things afloat there. While, you know, Joe Brady, I don't know if you're going to have anybody that comes in and really does what Joe Brady did because you might not ever find somebody that much of a lightning in a bottle at a cheap price again like that. So I guess that is a a good open-ended question. But, yeah, the more I think about it, that is a boring question because it's either one of those two guys. So my bad. (laughs) Uh, So what did you think about the Pelini hire then? A guy that's kind of been out of the main spotlight for a while but has a good resume overall. Yeah, you know, I think my initial reaction when I first heard about it was a lot of confusion, a lot of I don't know if I see the fit, I don't know about hiring a guy who hasn't coached at this level in six years, all that. But, you know, the more I've talked to people who, who played for him at Youngstown State, who coached with him his last 20 years, and I'll have a story coming out tomorrow at some point. But the more I really ask, I, I really do think, I'm not, I'm not sure he's going to be Dave Aranda. I bet there is going to be some kind of drop-off. But, I mean, he is one of the most respected defensive minds in the game. And I think his situation is more complicated than, oh, he went to go be Youngstown State's coach. He went home. He went to a town that he actually, like, sincerely beloves and is still best friends with all of his friends from there. And he was still getting paid from Nebraska. Yeah. And, you know, I think and he, so he didn't have to worry about money. And, you know, I think you also factor in that he obviously had a very messy breakup with Nebraska, which I think kind of kept some schools from maybe looking at him those first few years. But now that, I mean, but he's not coming here to be a head coach. He's coming here to be a defensive coordinator. I talked to one of his best friends at Youngstown State, and they were saying, I think he was kind of itching to get back to that challenge of, of not worrying about classes or, you know, GPA. I mean, he's supposed to worry about those things, but you know what I mean. And yeah. like having all the personnel decisions and all those things, he just gets to go back and coach defense, which is something I think he loves. And I think he wants the challenge of going back to being a DC. And all of that is a long way of saying, I think we forgot how good of a defensive coach he was because of because we started thinking of him as what he was as a head coach or all the drama that came around him. But I do kind of think I've come around that it is a pretty damn good hire, darn good hire. Do you do you think that you could, you can say damn? That's okay. Um, did you think that <laughs> AFR. did did Nebraska being bad after he left like does that actually help his reputation in a weird way? Oh, I think it has to. I mean, that is really funny that he was this. I mean, I'm trying to think of a great comparison. He was like the Jeff. He was almost made fun of like he was the Jeff Fisher of college football. Yeah. It was like a guarantee he'd go 9-3 and three every single year. But now we've had 20, 20 years of Nebraska football in, in the century, and I think it's becoming clear that that's a tougher job than people realize. I mean, don't get me wrong, that's a, that's a huge program, but it is a tough job at this day and age and location and all those things. And then, you know, 
obviously we've seen that what the, the rebuild going on with Mike Riley and now Scott Frost. I think seeing the success they had, going to two Big Ten title games, pretty consistently having a great defense, at least in those early years. I mean, I think it really has come to show, oh, wow, he did a much better job than any of us really realized. And uh, I think he, I think that's kind of that, – that has definitely helped his stock a little bit, I would imagine, in the last two or three years. Yeah, and you look, I mean, recruiting, I don't know. Uh, maybe I'm misspeaking that he didn't recruit these guys, but you know he had like a Dominican Sue, Amir Abdullah, Prince Mukumar. Like he had a he had a lot of talent up there. Um, Brody, right now on the Athletic, your latest article posted two hours ago. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but this is a hell of a headline. Following a long needed eye procedure, John Emery's sky high potential may come into focus. Uh, nice job using a little vision <laughs> pun in there, but but what is this article all about? What is this eye procedure? Yeah, so so John Emery, I mean, has been. This is he. he had, first off, he had LASIK eye surgery last week, which mm. is, which is news. And I, I think the big thing with him is he has been, you know, according to his dad, legally blind for pretty much in one eye for his entire life. I mean, he was diagnosed in ninth grade with it, and you know, they they had a lot of short term solutions like wearing you know one special contact in one eye, then might have done other damage to his other eye. And, it's been something that, I mean, he's still become the number one running back in the country coming out of his high school class with limited vision. And I don't, I'm not, I don't want to overstate it. I don't think it's a crippling thing, but it really, really hurt him in the pass catching department and some yeah. other areas. And it was definitely something that limited his, his potential. And so, I, I mean, I think that it's a huge thing for him now that he is 2020. He is, that is, that's going to be a big part because you're running back. I think that is pretty important. And I don't want to understate, you know, that there's it's more complicated than that why his freshman year didn't go as many hope. I mean, we all have heard that, you know, I think he had to learn how to work harder. I think he had to, you know, get more into the playbook. He really needed to learn to block, and that's the number one thing I think he really struggled with his freshman season. I think it's more it's, – it's a complex thing about all the lessons that John Emery had to learn. I mean, he even went to his father, you know, midway through the season and admitted, I need to grow up. So it's, wow. it, it's more complicated than just eyesight. But, yeah, I think that is going to be a – a big piece of the puzzle for a guy who definitely seems like now that he's healthy, maybe a breakout candidate his sophomore season. Well, and, and just outside looking in using the very little bits of information that we have, um, it's been interesting to watch his first year go down because sometimes when you have that super highly heralded recruit and maybe they don't file the field immediately, there can be a lot of bad feelings created there. But just a few weeks ago, you know, he's tweeting, if you don't come to LSU, you're an idiot. You're telling stories about him basically telling his own dad, you know, I got to grow up. And to me, that really speaks to what you've written about, which is the character of this team and the older generation kind of passing on lessons to the younger generation. So I really like all of that. Uh, I'm not going to ask a question about that, though. Talking to Brody Miller of The Athletic. <laughs> Brody, running back hierarchy going into next season, going into spring ball. Um, did Curry launch himself to the four here? Or is it TDP and the others? Like, do you have an idea of kind of – where the pole position is going into spring ball? Yeah, I think that really is the most fascinating. I mean, there might be more impactful decisions going on this next few months, but I think the most interesting is running back because it just feels so sincerely wide open. You know, like Davis Bryce was obviously the most productive throughout this season and definitely the most trustworthy and consistent. Ed Ogeron has said that himself. And then, you know, Chris Curry was at the bottom of the depth chart all year, and then all of a sudden now he blew everyone away during – you know, Peach Bowl practice, it got the start, looked great that game. And I think suddenly the, the coaching staff is like, well, maybe we'd look closer at him for that spot. And I think he surprised them a lot. But then there's no secret that Emery is probably the most talented of that group. I mean, his his potential is just ridiculous when, when he puts it all together. We've seen some of those runs that he can just do things most people can't. So it, and now that you add, you know, him having better eyesight, maybe learning some lessons, it is, it's going to be so fascinating because I, if you ask my hierarchy right now, yeah, maybe I say Curry has a slight edge number one, but I might be lying to you because I really think it's going to be so even going into the spring because they all have a chance and all have a legitimate case. I mean, I, I remember we talked about on our show that if I had to make a pick right now about who's starting in September, I'll say Emery just because I think he is the most to gain, the most to, you know, with a full off season learn and develop with all that talent. But I could, I wouldn't be shocked at all if it was Davis Price or something like that. Ogeron was here 24 hours ago and said from the passing game coordinator standpoint, it'll take full focus next week and that George Munoz could be a candidate. Did that surprise you? It did surprise me. And I, yeah, by the way, great job on that, guys. And yeah, I, I, uh, yeah, I you're welcome. Everybody the way I think there was a lot of, yeah, thanks, buddy. I think there was a lot of confusion on Twitter about like, what does that mean? Yeah. But I mean, it's, it's not in hindsight. I mean, okay. I think we all know that 
LSU was always interested in him for that job. They just their timeline was different than Munoz had to be. It isn't that different from the Dennis Johnson situation, where I think LSU and you know and Baylor had just had different timelines and they had to make a decision. I think they would have. I don't. I don't know if George Munoz is going to get that job, and it obviously wouldn't be a great look for Munoz to kind of burn Dave Aranda like that a few weeks later. But it isn't surprising, I guess, in hindsight that. Yeah, he took the Baylor job because LSU wasn't ready to make a decision, but LSU was still interested in him and could probably pay more than Baylor would pay for a receiver coach. That that does make sense to me. It's going to be fascinating to see what LSU does with that job because you would imagine it's a wide pool of candidates. You know, you have your Munozes, but there's going to be some NFL names involved, I think. There's going to be a lot of people probably interested in that position based on what Joe Brady just did.